Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you so much. It's really nice to be um, presenting to this group. Um, so today I'm just going to talk about some previous work I've done and some uh, progress that um, making as part of a working group that's thinking about ways to integrate historical data into Caribbean coral reef management and conservation. And so first I'll just give the group and kind of just a summary of what's been going on in Caribbean reefs since uh, scientists first began really systematically monitoring them in the 1970s. Um, since that time, scientists have noticed a profound change on Caribbean reefs that began, um, at least you know, from their perspective, having viewed reefs just since the 70s, with the die-off of this urchin, the Diadema antelarum urchin, which was the last remaining herbivore on many Caribbean reefs following the overfishing of uh, herbivorous fishes, such as parrotfish. And that happened in the 1980s. And then around that same time, um, there are these coral disease outbreaks that, that began emerging, um, particularly affecting the acroporid corals, the elkhorn and staghorn corals shown here. And this was white band disease. And then there are other coral diseases that began emerging after white band disease. And then in the 1990s, coral bleaching really became um, prominent and has been increasing in frequency and, and um, severity since, and that's from climate change impacts. And so the end result of all of these you know, massive disturbances was a loss of at least 50% of total coral cover across the Caribbean since the 70s, a loss of about 95% of these acroporid corals. And these are really ecologically important corals because they grow orders of magnitude faster and taller than other corals in the Caribbean. And then um, the, these changes result, resulted in the shift in the dominance from these branching corals to macroalgae and lower leaf corals. And this resulted in a loss of the habitat complexity, three-dimensional structure, carbonate production, biodiversity, lots of different kind of metrics of ecosystem functioning. But, um, you know, and then this is just a time series of some photographs taken from the same reef site in the Florida Keys. It just sort of shows the, how dramatic the transformation of Caribbean reefs has been since the 70s. And this is typical of many reefs across the Caribbean. So, um, and this is from a series of photos taken by Jean Shin. Um, so here in the 1970s, you can see the reef is, you know, basically a uh, really high percentage of living corals. These are cropperid corals, the elkhorn and staghorn corals. There's a massive coral in the middle here. And then by 1988, all the branching corals, the acroporid corals are dead and they're starting to be covered over in algae. And then the, ma um, the massive coral is still there. Then in, by 1998, uh, even the massive coral is gone and the reef is just sort of covered with sea fans and algae. And then 2004, it's just all sea fans and algae and the corals have not recovered. You can also tell from the series of photographs that there's a notable decline in water visibility, or water clarity decline. And this is a typical of what's been seen in many Caribbean reefs. And um, because there isn't really a good kind of high resolution, long-term baseline of what reefs looked like before the 1970s, well, there are a lot of different kind of mechanisms that have been posed by researchers as being responsible for these shifts. So there's regional stressors like temperature stress from climate change, there's physical damage from hurricanes. There's the overfishing of herbivores and then the loss of that herbivorous urchin, uh, Diadema antelarum, which was made kind of more important on the reefs after herbivorous fishes were overfished. And then there's nutrification and sedimentation from land-based runoff. But the um, kind of relative importance of these stressors is still pretty much unresolved due to the lack of the um, baseline data. And then, you know, adding to that complexity, is that it's been hard to disentangle the root causes of Caribbean reef declines due to you know, these stressors are happening at the same time and they interact synergistically. So for example, coral disease is often cited as the root cause of coral loss across the Caribbean. Coral disease uh, can be exacerbated by increases in macroalgae. Macroalgae, increases in macroalgae can be caused by a loss of herbivory resulting from the overfishing of reef herbivores. And then there's land-based runoff that can also result in increases in macroalgae and directly cause coral disease. And then there's anthropogenic climate change causing coral bleaching. Coral bleaching can, can 
Um, and then land based runoff can also lead to coral bleaching. Coral bleaching can lead to coral disease. And then there are feedbacks in the system that complicate things even further. So coral disease and bleaching result in death of corals that open up more space for macroalgae to take over. Increases in macroalgae can lead to increases in coral disease and bleaching, et cetera, et cetera. So you kind of get the idea of how hard it is to really get at the root causes of change. Um, and then the lack of a baseline has also led to a tendency of a lot of reef scientists in the Caribbean to sort of um, not be able to distinguish between symptoms of reef declines like disease and bleaching from the ultimate drivers, which would be you know, human impacts such as land-based runoff, overfishing of reef herbivores, and climate change. But you know, historical data, paleoarchaeological and historical archives are showing that you know, human impacts um, span the last millennia, at least in the Caribbean. So for example, here's some data from middens, from midden heaps uh, across some Caribbean islands. And they show that overfishing on Caribbean reefs has occurred for millennia. So there's kind of three metrics that they measured that all indicate overfishing. So there's the proportion of midden kind of material that's, that's made up of fish bones. And so the abundance of fish bones has declined since you know the last, from 2000 years ago to about 500 years ago. The size of the fish bones has declined around that same time. And then the trophic level of fish bones has declined around that same time. So these are all pretty clear signs of historical overfishing. And then there's data from um, paleoecological studies. And this is these are some studies I've been involved in from reef sediment cores that we collected in Panama and Belize. And we looked at the abundance of parrotfish through time from their teeth fossils that were really abundant in these cores. And here I'm showing um, the year and the proportion of parrotfish teeth within each of these cores of, of all total fish teeth. And you can see a decline in, in the relative abundance of parrotfish teeth occurred from around a thousand years ago to, uh, to a few hundred years ago in Panama. And parrotfish teeth declined around a couple hundred years ago in Belize. And in both of these regions, we also uh, conducted a causal analysis that showed a direct positive causal relationship between parrotfish teeth abundance and reef accretion rates. So the loss of parrotfish teeth has, or the loss of parrotfish has directly caused a decline in reef accretion rates. So this shows that historical overfishing has impaired Caribbean reef ecosystem function. And we looked at you know, possible environmental drivers for lo the loss of parrotfish and you know, couldn't find any clear links between environmental drivers and parrotfish. So this really implicates overfishing in these declines. And then there are other um, studies. So here's another study I was involved in that combines paleoecological, historical, and recent monitoring data from thousands of reef sites across the Caribbean, thousands of surveys, um, and looked at the relative abundance of the dominance of these two ecologically important corals, the Elkhorn and Staghorn coral. Um, from the pre-human period, the Pleistocene period, to the present. And we found that Caribbean and cropper coral declines occurred decades before coral disease and bleaching. So here I'm just showing with the blue lines, the first significant instance of decline in dominance of each of these coral species relative to the pre-human period or Pleistocene. For the Alcorn coral, declines first occurred in the 1950s. And this was you know, two decades before white band disease was recorded about three and a half decades before the diadema urchin died off, and about four decades before coral bleaching. For the staghorn coral, similar thing, we found declines first occurred in the 1960s, and this was a decade before white band disease, two and a half decades before the diadema die off, three decades before bleaching. So clearly something was going on before climate change impacts, although climate change has obviously been really devastating to corals in the Caribbean. The sort of trajectory of declines was was set in place before um, climate change. And so this implicates local human stressors like fishing or land-based pollution. And so here, this is uh, from the similar compilation of paleo-historical and modern survey data. And here we're just looking at the prevalence of different coral species through time. And we've grouped the species into life history categories, competitive, stress tolerant, and weedy. And the bottom panel is just the proportion of sites with each of these three life history groups 
present, and the top panel is by species. And this shows the um, Caribbean coral community shifts since human arrival are indicating like that environmental conditions have become increasingly uh, increasingly stressful through time. And so the Caribbean coral communities were transformed via a three-step process. The first was the loss of the competitive corals that occurred um, in the by the 1960s here indicated by this pink arrow. And then once the uh, proper corals were lost, these stress tolerant and weedy corals began increasing up into the mid eighties. And then around 1990 or so, even these hardy corals began declining from coral disease and bleaching. So this is all just to say that, you know, historical studies, these, and there's there several other really neat historical ecology studies done in the Caribbean that are showing that Caribbean reefs were profoundly altered prior to modern surveys. And, and we, we all know as a group that historical data are useful for informing reef management and conservation. And I think we're all really interested in just trying to make these data more applicable to decision making. And so, um, you know, I'm part of a working group that has been thinking about this too. How can we try to better integrate these historical data into decision making for reefs? And so this is the working group that, um, that we have convened. It's funded by the Conservation Paleobiology Network, and it's focused on you know, how can historical data inform reef management, management and policy in the Caribbean. And this working group is focused on two major management issues. Uh, coastal zone management or reef water quality. And um, I'm leading this working group and here are our members. And then Lauren McClanahan is leading the working the subgroup um, focused on fisheries management issues. And we have a really neat collection of members that span um, environmental NGOs. We have conservation practitioners. We actually have scientists from management agencies. And then we have scientists from academia, historical ecologists from academia. And this has been really cool to get together because we have people that are actually really kind of in, in it, in the trenches, trying to help manage reefs. And they've been really helpful for trying to kind of help us sort out what data are needed, um, what the major kind of political and policy issues um, exist for different reefs, and how we can better integrate these data into management. And so kind of the three main um, goals of this working group and the three main tasks that we're focused on right now are number one, just first identifying the historical data that, are, that exist that are useful for tracking trends in fish stock status or reef fish management issues and reef water quality for um, watershed management issues. And then two, we want to sort of provide proof of concept that historical data are useful for management by first synthesizing some available historical data from well-studied fisheries or reefs. And these are case studies. And I'll provide a few case studies that we have compiled so far for the reef water quality issue. And then we also you know, ultimately want to identify potential pathways for using historical data and management. And so, um, in the Caribbean, I think, in, and on reefs in general, reef water quality declines and ecosystem impacts of these declines are largely unquantified. So a lot of effort has been paid to, and a lot of attention has been given to the role of overfishing in reef declines, particularly the role of parrotfish overfishing for Caribbean reef declines. And this is, you know, with good cause, parrotfish are really important. And in fact, many countries in the Caribbean have actually banned fishing of parrotfish, but the water quality issue has largely been ignored. And this is just due to a lack of systematic monitoring efforts. There's just very little water quality data for reefs in the Caribbean and in general. And so there's widespread acknowledgement that this is a problem, land use pollution is a problem for reefs, but the scope of the problem has really not been identified. And here I'm just pointing you again towards a series of photographs from the same reef in the Caribbean. It just really clearly shows there has been a decline in reef water visibility. But again, this is sort of qualitative, it's not quantitative. So we're trying to kind of remedy that by compiling some different types of historical data to get a handle on this, the timing and the scope and eventually the causes of reef water quality declines. And so land-based pollution um, is important to look at for coral reef conservation because it weakens reef health in several ways. 
uh, mainly through nutrients and sediments from, from land. So nutrients can harm corals because they cause phytoplankton blooms that reduce light clarity. Corals need clear waters. So their symbiotic algae can photosynthesize. And nutrients also fertilize benthic macro algae that can feed with corals for space and can smother corals. And sediments are detrimental to corals because they can shade, smother, or abrade coral polyps, and they can inhibit the settlement and survival of coral larvae. And then other pollutants like to hang out on sediments, like uh, pathogens and toxins like pesticides and herbicides that can also harm coral health. And we, our first activity as a working group was to just identify the different types of historical data that are useful for tracking long-term trends in reef, reef water quality. And here are the kind of different categories that we've identified. First, there's paleo data. So these are reef sediment cores and coral cores. And these span 100, 100 to thousands of years into the past. And these can provide information about reef water quality change and impacts to reef ecosystem functioning via the composition of reef fossils, the so community composition changes. We can look at metrics of reef health, like reef accretion rates and coral growth rates. We can look at coral stress bands that indicate past incidences of coral bleaching. We can get an idea of the amount of land-based sediments reaching reefs by looking at acid and soluble residues within these cores. And then we can also really importantly, look at geochemical proxies of land-based input. And this is from stable isotopes of nitrogen, carbon, and oxygen. And then there are historical archives and these span hundreds of thousands of years ago. And these can give us information about reef extent and coral community composition. But unlike for fisheries issues, these historical archives are not as useful for watershed management issues or land-based runoff issues. These um, kind of early explorers and early scientific expeditions didn't really note proxies of water quality very well, but we could get at the reef extent, which would be useful. And then there are natural history collections and museum specimens that span tens to hundreds of years. And these can give you these geochemical proxies of land-based input from stable isotopes. We also have remote sensing data. And here, our working group has decided to take kind of a more inclusive, um, use a more inclusive definition of historical data. So we are including data that span decades into the past because there are so there's just so little information about water quality on reefs that we'll sort of take what we can get. So this can include remote sensing data and monitoring data that span back to the 70s and 80s. And remote sensing data can give you um, information about water clarity via the photic depth. It can tell you about phytoplankton blooms via the chlorophyll A, and it can give you um, measurements of suspended sediments from land-based runoff. And then survey and monitoring data has turned out to be really important for this project in the spans uh, decades back to the 70s or so. And this gives you information about water clarity uh, via two kind of general methods. Um, there's this second disk that can be lowered into the water. It's just a really low tech, simple way to measure water visibility. The depth at which the second disk appears is the second depth. The deeper the depth, the clearer the waters. You can get information about water clarity from turbidity measurements from these instruments called SONS that are being deployed on many reefs recently in the Caribbean. And then you can look at nutrient input from just measuring the nutrient content of seagrasses and other organisms. And so we kind of very early on honed in on um, these monitoring programs to help us try to um, focus on particular case studies in the Caribbean for sites that have been relatively well studied. And just to see, if these monitoring programs provide any insight into long-term trends in reef water quality change. So the gold standard for monitoring programs in the Caribbean is this CARICOMP program. This is a Caribbean coastal monitoring program that was started by Jorge Cortez and others, started in the early 1990s and unfortunately ended in 2015 due to a lack of funding. But they employed this standardized sampling protocol generally weekly um, and from the took these secchi disk measurements. And from these secchi disk measurements, um, which they, they took these measurements and other a whole array of measurements across over 20 different reef sites across the Caribbean. But for sites that we have a really long time series, 10 years or more, um, the secchi disk measurements are showing pretty clear declines in water clarity 
through time. Um, and this has been really useful for us identifying well monitoring sites that we well monitored sites that we'd like to delve into further. And we also became aware of you know, the potential for combining different monitoring data sets. So here I'm showing um, water visibility again, and it's been measured in two different ways generally. From the carry count program, we have the SECI disk measurements, and then the Marine Geo Smithsonian monitoring program, they have, have these on these instruments that measure turbidity. And at two sites, they have taken measurements at the exact same location for the carry comp data and the Marine Geo data. And so it could be useful to combine these time series to get a longer uh, history of change. So for instance, here in Boca del Toro, Panama, we're seeing a decline in the SECI depth. We're seeing what looks to be a decline in um, an increase in turbidity, turbidity or decline in water clarity through time from the Marine Geo data um, set. And then similarly in Caribo Key, we see a decline in psyche depth from the carry comp data up to 2015. And then we also see a continued decline in water clarity from the Marine Geo SOM measurements. And so our working group is kind of grappling right now with how best to combine these disparate time series. Do we want to plot things on similar Y axes? Is it okay to plot things separately? And so we can have a discussion about that if anybody has any insights or ideas about that after the talk. And so um, now I'm just going to present kind of the compilation of time series that we have so far. This is still a work in progress, very early days. And so these are initial results. So I just ask people to not share them um, beyond just viewing them on the QMARI website and recording. But um, I'll present three case studies right now. The first is Discovery Bay, Jamaica. And this is the iconic poster child for Caribbean reef declines. This was the epicenter of reef studies uh, starting in the 1950s because there's a research station in Discovery Bay. It's well known that um, overfishing occurred in Jamaica for you know, at least a century. But this is an island nation and that has been very heavily dependent on reef fishes for food security for a long time. Um, and scientists were here kind of in real time watching the collapse of these reefs um, following hurricanes, the diadema disease die out, white band disease, all those things we talked about in the beginning of the talk. And so here, just to illustrate that decline is a photograph from this reef, the Reef in 1972, that's just all living coral, the Crawford corals. And then by 2013, it's just rubble of these corals and there's been no recovery. And so, we, we compiled a few different types of data. First, we looked at different proxies of nutrient input through time. So here we have dissolved inorganic nitrogen, soluble reactive phosphorus. So nitrogen and phosphorus are the two nutrients that we're most interested in tracking. They, um, they can negatively impact coral health in different ways and fertilize um, algae in different ways. And um, so the, it's important to look at just the kind of total nitrogen content and the total phosphorus content, and also the nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. When this ratio is really high, when nitrogen is really high relative to phosphorus, this negatively impacts the symbiosis between um, symbiotic algae and corals. And so you can see here that nutrient increases are not really apparent until after 2000, here in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus alone, and then the nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. We can see from the SECI depth measurements, this is from the Curie Comp monitoring program, that water quality declines are really apparent, but we only have data starting in 1983, so we don't really know what's going on before that. But these declines around the 90s was a time of dramatic increases in land use change from agriculture and tourism development. Um, we also know from historical data that fishing impacts you know, perceived land use impacts in Jamaica. So reefs were overfished by the 1950s. And so fishing impacts could have been impacting coral cover. So here we have a really nice long time series of coral cover from the 1970s to 2012. And we see um, declines were occurring before nutrient increases, but we're not really quite sure what was going on with water quality. So a coral core record could help resolve this in this case. And these results, just to bring it back to management applications, um, 
show that the simultaneous mitigation of overfishing and land based pollution is necessary for coral recovery in this site. Corals have generally not recovered in, um, in Jamaica, and this is you know, thought to be due to overfishing. But I'll go back to these photos that I showed here. Even in 1972, you can see there's already no fish on the reef, but there's still lots of corals. So, you know, one hypothesis is that when the fish were already gone, but the urchins were still there eating the algae, then when the urchins died, that was sort of the tipping point leading to the death of corals. But what was also going on with nutrient impacts to reefs? Could that have also pushed corals over the edge? Could that have encouraged them to reach their tipping point? And that's something that could be resolved if we had a longer term period of deep water quality change. So um, that means we should go collect some coral cores and make that. And the second case study is from Caribou Cave, Belize. And here's a picture of the reef site. This is also a well studied area because the Smithsonian has a research station here and it's right on the edge of the Belize Barrier Reef. You can see right here. So it's really far from land. It's, I believe, about 20 kilometers from land or so. So it's long been thought that this area was just kind of impervious to impacts of land use change. But I'll show you some data to, to suggest otherwise. Here's some photos from 1982. There's, again, lots of living coral, mostly crop root corals. And here's a photograph that I took in 2013. There's still some crop root corals hanging on, but it's a lot more sea fans and, and more macro algae. So this uh, compilation of time series is a little bit different. We have a long, continuous record of visibility via the SECI measurements and the turbidity measurements from the sand here. And that shows a continuous decline in visibility on the reef from the 90s to the present. We also see a concomitant decline in coral cover at that time. And because these, these trends look so tightly linked, I just did a regression. And you see there's like significant um, positive correlation between water visibility and coral cover. And to, to my knowledge, this is the first time these two data sets have been combined like that. And it would be really neat to combine this for multiple sites across the Caribbean. Um, and then water quality continues to decline from 2015 on, but by that point, coral cover is already really low. In 2015. And um, so this, these data, you know, these are still preliminary and we're still gathering more data, but these data so far show that offshore reef sites are also significantly affected by water quality declines. And Belize have banned the fishing of parrotfishes and parrotfish are actually starting to recover across many reefs. But these data also show from the coral cover being so low, if the protection of herbivores alone will not allow for coral recovery, the land-based pollution also needs to be mitigated. And then the third um, case study I'll show is from Puerto Morelos, Mexico. And this was you know, once a sleepy fishing village um, along the Yucatan Peninsula, south of Cancun, um, that had lots of living coral. Here's a picture from 1978. Here's a picture from today. Coral cover is very, very low. And then you can see it's really built up for tourism now. And it's widely acknowledged that reefs across the Yucatan are really suffering from this mass tourism that has come online since the 90s, 2000s, um, and the lack of sewage treatment facilities. So this is all just limestone, you know, underneath these hotels. And so um, with served by septic systems. So um, it's kind of said you can flush your toilet from your hotel at night and you can be swimming in that on the reef the next day. But the, the impacts of water quality on coral reclines has really not been quantified. So I'm going to also in the Caribbean. But so here I'll show, um, here we have a record from coral cores of stable isotopes of nitrogen. The higher the value of these stable isotopes, um, the, the more sewage input there is. Um, so you can see there's an increase in stable isotopes of nitrogen since the 1990s or so. And that supports the increase in tourism around this time. And there are also a lot of other neat time series of stabilized tubes of nitrogen from museum specimens and seagrasses that show similar trends and similar timing. And so that tells us that it would be useful to conduct a regional synthesis that combines lots of different reef sites from the Yucatan. I mean, we're I'm working on that effort now. You can um, also see here there's dissolved inorganic nitrogen, 
but it's pretty sparse and, and inconclusive. You don't see a clear pattern. Um, so other forms of water quality monitoring are sparse in space and time and don't really show clear trends. And then the Secchi disk measurements, unfortunately, are just a little too short in their duration to say much. Um, they don't really show much of a trend, although we know water quality was declining during this time. So it would be useful to rely more on this coral core record. Um, and then the coral, the coral cover, we're still obtaining in the process of obtaining a uh, longer time series here. You can see coral cover used to be a lot higher in the 70s, and it's just relatively uniformly low since the 90s on, it's like 1%. And so the, this compilation of time series so far shows that quantifying the link between sewage input and reef health would really inform wastewater management. And all three of these case studies are also really highlighting the need for better water quality monitoring efforts in the Caribbean. Um, we need these, this still really is not being monitored very well. And so um, that's another point that we're going to make in our papers and in our outreach efforts really to implement some water quality monitoring um, in these sites and beyond. And so just to summarize our initial working group efforts, there's an array of historical data that currently exists for reconstructing trends in Caribbean reef water quality that mostly remain untapped in disparate repositories. And our initial data compilation efforts show that declines in reef water quality across the Caribbean occur at the same time with declines in corals. And so kind of just getting back to the heart of the matter, how can these historical time series inform and be integrated into reef management? These are things we're still grappling with, but here's some actions we have planned to help, to help resolve that. The first is we are demonstrating via these scientific case studies, the utility of historical data for tracking water quality change and showing that it really is a problem. If water quality has really defined and it's resulted in changes in reef health. The second, um, actions we have planned are just making managers, scientists, and stakeholders aware of these existing relevant data sources and the shortcomings of current monitoring programs. We're, we're lucky that we can leverage the institutions that our working group members are affiliated with. Many of them have already started their own NGOs in Caribbean countries, and so they'll use their outreach channels and, and connections to local communities to really advocate for better water quality monitoring. And third, um, we, we want to via our efforts you know, by publishing peer-reviewed scientific publications and outreach um, efforts. We want to advocate for including these historical data in reef management. And so I'll just leave you with some potential ways um, that historical data could be directly applied to management decisions for reefs in the Caribbean. So it, it could help identify ecological tipping points and help set ecologically appropriate reef water quality targets. Most water quality targets that exist for coastal areas in the Caribbean are just focused on human health. They're not focused on coastal ecosystem health. Um, we could encourage integrated coastal zone management, reef reef management, and improved wastewater treatment, especially in marine protected areas. Many of these sites that we're focused on, the case studies that I showed you, are from marine protected areas, but they are not being protected against sources of land-based pollution, and that needs to be changed. And um, these historical data could also help determine the appropriateness of coral restoration efforts. Coral restoration is just booming across the Caribbean, and historical data um, on water quality could help prioritize areas for restoration. Um, by you know, identifying areas that have relatively high coral resilience despite sustained poor water quality. If we can find some hardy corals on some reefs, propagate those guys, and um, you know, if water quality remains poor, they have a good chance of surviving. And then identify areas that have stable water quality values through time and focus efforts on planting corals there. And we'd want to avoid planting corals in the areas that are subject to recent declines in water quality. And I will end there and just want to thank everyone that has enabled this series of projects. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you. I will just stop recording now.